right. Let's see the time. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Alexander Smith is a researcher at CRCAO in Paris. He did his PhD at the Gold Hadik des Sotetudes uh, on Tibetan divination practices under the supervision of Professor Charles Rambo. And uh, he's currently a visiting fellow at IKGF, where he's studying a form of Tibetan rope divination called Jutik. Today he'll be talking about the structure and usages of Tibetan clearmancy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alexander Smith. Um, first of all, thank you all very much for coming. I realize this is a little bit atypical. Um, in extreme brief, the story behind this is that uh, my mother, who's in the United States, is uh, extremely ill, and she's never seen me speak or teach or do any kind of presentation. So I hatched this idea to film myself in Napoli, giving uh, a, a slightly longer version of the talk that I'm going to do today. And um, uh, since I did not have the expertise of the IT staff, um, it was uh, largely speaking a disaster. And so I uh, hatched the idea to do this today, and with the help of Professor Balseger, he sort of made it all uh, become a reality. So you are all more or less on film, uh, but do feel, feel free to ask any questions at the end. Um, if you'd like, you know, if you're self-edited out of uh, the video, that is all entirely possible. I don't think my mother would mind um, terribly. Uh, in any case, today, as Mercedes said, I'm going to be talking about uh, claromantic divination manuals um, in Tibetan cultures, focusing in particular on the issue of prognostic structure. Um, so we're going to be looking at the results uh, chapter of divination manuals, the section where um, after you've cast your dice, stones, or ropes, the sections of text that you refer to in order to um, interpret the outcome of your casting. And I'll be asking a number of um, really pre-methodological questions. What is the value, for example, of studying the compositional structure of divination manuals? And um, are there homogeneous uh, structural or stylistic elements that can help us to characterize the genre. Um, but seeing as I, I have a, a generous amount of time today, I'd also like to discuss Tibetan divination practices in uh, more general terms, um, to give you an idea of what these practices look like on the ground, um, how they're represented in Tibetan manuscript culture, and also um, to give you an impression of the uh, young Western academic discipline that's growing up around the subject of uh, Tibetan divination. Now, in many Tibetan-speaking cultures, um, human beings are considered to be vulnerable to a variety of influences, both um, natural and supernatural, including the planets and stars, as well as a variety of gods, demons, demigods, and, um, and regional spirits. And on the one hand, um, the interrelationship of all of these forces, whether it's harmonious or inharmonious, is believed to exert a considerable amount of control over individual human lives, and um, also to affect the way that society operates on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, on the other hand, um, all of these forces can be influenced um, and even controlled through various forms of ritual action. Um, and those rituals can differ dramatically in their size and sophistication, uh, ranging, for example, from daily sangcho offerings, these would be um, basic fumigation practices, to the construction of unbelievably elaborate mandalas in preparation for things like the, the Dalai Lama's birthday. Now, uh, within this, this framework, uh, divination provides uh, a mechanism through which individuals are able to gain insight into the nature and tendencies of the various elemental, uh, social, or supernatural forces that could potentially affect their lives. 
Now we're gonna come back to this relationship between divination and ritual in a few minutes, um, but first, as I said, I'd like to discuss divination in general terms, um, beginning uh, with a kind of edict taxonomy that makes it a little bit easier to discuss Tibetan divination practices in a, um, uh, in a systematic fashion. Now, um, in my work, I advocate a distinction between what I term mechanical and inspirational forms of divination. That's terminology that I've adapted from uh, Professor David Zeitlin's research on African divination systems. And um, in this context, inspirational divination refers to divination practices that depend um, entirely on a relationship expressed between the diviner and um, some form of uh, supernatural or divine agency typically involving a form of uh, possession as the medium through which revelation is expressed. Uh, mechanical divination refers to forms of divination that make use of mechanistic apparatuses um, external to the operator that if they're correctly interpreted um, uh, could serve as a medium through which truth can be articulated or a supernatural agency could be divined. And something that's important to, to keep in mind is that uh, my research interests are limited to forms of Tibetan claromancy, which is very much in the mechanical side of things. And as a consequence, my remarks should not be taken as characteristic of prophecy um, or the activities of so-called spirit mediums or oracles in Tibetan cultures. Although if you're interested in spirit mediumship, I'd be happy to, uh, to give you a few readings after the, after the lecture. But uh, to continue with the theme of divination and its texts, um, as some of you know, uh, I'm sure, uh, there really are very many different forms of divination practiced in Tibetan cultures. And many of those practices are rooted, they're uh, based in the use, uh, in the interpretation of some type of uh, divination manual. So uh, with texts in mind, sort of going back in time, uh, if we look back to the earliest extant literature from, from Dunhuang, uh, these are the earliest sources in Tibetan studies that, that we have, uh, you'll find a number of different forms of divination. You'll find, for example, a divination by crow calling. Um, that's the divination by the flight patterns and the songs of crows of Corvus Corvide in a few places, notably in uh, PT 1045. Uh, dice divination appears in a number of texts. It's by far the most common form of divination represented in Dunhuang sources, um, including the ubiquitous uh, PT 1047, which was studied by Arian MacDonald and myself, among others. Uh, there's a little bit of spirit mediumship in there, in a PT 104, for example. Um, pebble, uh, pebbles feature in a number of texts as well, including PT 740. There's coin divination using uh, Chinese dong tse, as well as uh, divination by the selection of leather lots. Uh, the point being uh, that there's already a variety of different divination practices represented in the earliest sources that we possess. And stepping out of the realm of uh, Dunhuang classics, it's not uncommon to find things like um, mirror divination, of which there are uh, several different forms. Mirror divination being said uh, traditionally to have been brought to Tibet by Padmasambhava. Um, there's scapulomancy, uh, burning the um, uh, scapula generally of a sheep and then reading the cracks that form in the bone. Um, there are fingernail divinations where you uh, squeeze someone's fingernail, generally someone's thumb, uh, and then offer prognostications based on the color of the nail as the blood flows back in. Um, there's mala divination, of course, which is a little bit like um, he loves me, he loves me not. I don't know if you have that here, but um, uh, that's uh, plucking petals off of a flower, typically in, in oxide daisy, as it's known in America. Um, and then there are divinations by uh, rope and string. So jutig, for example, uh, which I'm working on at the IKGF, is a well-known rope divination in many bun communities, um, which involves uh, tying knots and nooses into a group of ropes. And you then throw them into the air and um, uh, read the patterns that form when they, when they hit the ground. Um, there are many other forms of, of divination, uh, of course, that's just uh, scratching at the, the surface of Tibetan cultures, to be honest. But um, speaking about divination today, uh, particularly in uh, contemporary exile communities in India, where I've done my research, uh, the most common forms of divination are almost certainly uh, dice divination and mala divination. And um, over the course of my field work in Himachal Pradesh, um, the professional or semi-professional diviners that I met were referred to either as, um, I always do this, I forget that I'm, I'm not speaking to Tibetan, so I apologize. Some of my terms are not going to be uh, transcribed. 
um, but they're referred to as either uh, mopa, moma is the second term for, for females, uh, mokyan, mokyapkyan, or motsipa. And those are all uh, kind of just ways of saying diviner or person who does divination. Um, and the catch-all phrase that's often used for these types of uh, mechanical uh, divination is uh, motsi or uh, mo, which basically just means divination. Now, um, I've often observed that uh, many professional diviners receive income in the form of uh, monetary or material donations from their clients. And um, if a diviner is a member of a, uh, a monastic community, uh, these donations typically are given uh, to the monastic authorities, um, or in some cases they can take the form of a client sponsoring rituals within a monastic community. Um, so it's important to remember as well um, that the performance of mo is not bound to a single profession, gender, or method. So uh, while uh, divinations performed by reincarnated chulku, um, uh, or just high-ranking lamas, are particularly respected or sought after, it's also common for lay people to perform um, simple rosary divinations to supplement their daily decision making. So um, with notable exceptions, there are no particular restrictions governing who can or cannot perform a number of uh, elementary divination practices. That said, there are forms of mechanical divination that require the practitioner to undertake a really rigorous uh, series of preliminary practices. These are known as uh, ngondro, which literally means the go before, more or less. Um, and uh, though mundra are not homogeneous, it's common for diviners to cultivate uh, through meditation and daily ritual practice uh, to cultivate a relationship with a variety of clairvoyant deities who are then called upon in guaranteeing the divination's accuracy. So in uh, contemporary exile communities, for example, it's very common to find the protectoresses Paldin Lamo, Achichoki Dulma, and Sipe Gyalmo, um, uh, all fantastic protectoresses, uh, propitiated as an essential element of the mundra um, underlying a number of, uh, of different claramantic practices. Now, um, something that, that stands out to me, looking back on that perfunctory list of various divination practices, is that many of these forms of motsi, um, the ones encountered in Tibetan communities, can be understood along edic or Western taxonomic lines as forms of claromancy. So this won't be a news to anyone, but what is claromancy really? So claromantic divinations make use of mobile elements, um, things like dice, stones, lots, ropes, or runes, which are cast by the diviner uh, so as to randomly generate a pattern, a set of symbols, um, or a particular numerical signifier. And the diviner then uh, refers to, to some type of interpretive catalog, either textual or memorized, in order to interpret the results of the casting and to generate a response to the client's, uh, the client's initial question. So for example, just stepping out of the uh, Tibetan cultural sphere for a moment, um, in the Central African example of Dembu Ngomo Yakusukula, which was studied at length by uh, Victor Turner, the diviner begins by placing 20 to 30 objects into a, a shallow, open-topped basket, a, a winnowing basket. Um, and the basket's then shaken in such a way that um, all of the objects fall into a heap on one side, and the diviner then examines uh, the top three or, or four objects. And in this case, uh, the interpretive catalog could be said to be rooted in Dembu oral culture, um, in that the interpretation of Wombo Yakusukulo's mobile elements uh, depends upon the memorization of uh, an enormous body of rigidly defined symbols, um, which are communicated orally from the diviner uh, to an apprentice, and not rooted in, uh, in textual form. Um, by way of contrast, um, some claromantic divinations, like the, the I Ching and Yoruba Aifa divination, are expressly textual, uh, whereas other forms of claromancy, like Nyo Lamuli divination, which is uh, studied uh, extensively by Susan Reynolds White, uh, can combine both written and memorized verses. Um, now, returning to the Tibetan cultural sphere, um, it's important to note that the majority of the claromantic practices that you find are textually oriented, which is to say, again, that they involve the mediation of an interpretive textual catalog. And there are a lot of different examples to choose from uh, when you're talking about textually oriented forms of claromancy. But just to give you an idea of um, how a divination manual can be used in practice, we can talk briefly about dice divination. As I said, uh, one of the most widely practiced forms of divination in contemporary Tibetan-speaking communities. Um, so in uh, one, uh, it's a great guy, by the way, the diviner on the left, fantastic stories about him uh, for another time. 
but um, in one common form of dice divination, at least one um, that's relatively homogeneous and quite common in Himachal Pradesh, uh, the diviner is required to possess, minimally speaking, um, three six-sided dice, as well as a variant of the relevant text. In this case, a divination manual associated with the Buddhist protectress, uh, Palden Moksor Gyalmo. Now, if you take a cursory glance at the prognosticatory section of the associated divination manual, you'll find that it's composed of uh, 16 sections, numbered 3 through 18. Uh, 3 through 18 because uh, that covers all of the 16 possible results that you can have with three six-sided dice. Uh, now, each of these 16 sections is then further divided into a series of 11 subsections, uh, which range from mercantile activities and, and travel to various health spiritual and domestic concerns. So in claromantic practices, what you often see is the use of uh, some kind of randomness generator, in our case, a set of three six-sided dice. And the randomized results of the casting are then read against in an in interpretive textual catalog um, that serves as a guideline from which the diviners are uh, able to craft a response to the client's question. And I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit more about that, um, that process, how responses are taken from divination manuals, um, and how they can sometimes be reskinned or um, creatively reinterpreted in different ways so as to suit the, the social and ethical complexities of life in the contemporary Tibetan diaspora. Um, but first, uh, something that's interesting to me is that um, looking at a, a cross-section of divinatory literature, uh, one of the genre's most distinctive qualities is that structurally speaking, uh, divination manuals display a high degree of homogeneity and temporal consistency. Um, they've changed very little, in fact, over the last 1,000 years. Now, broadly speaking, this is a feature of Tibetan manuscript culture, um, particularly when we're talking about ritual literature. Um, authorial creativity and innovation are often less highly valued than the ability to memorize and index vast collections of textual material. Um, and in that, that cultural context, innovation um, is often expressed as a kind of bricolage, um, uh, combining sections from pre-existing texts to create a new work um, that's still grounded in the authoritative lineage of its predecessors. And I think that this is uh, particularly evident in the composition of divinatory prognostics. I mean, I'd like to give you a few uh, thrilling textual examples in order to illustrate some of the basic structural features encountered when you're reading claromantic texts, uh, whether they're, they're ancient or contemporary. Um, now, to begin with, uh, Tibetan textual prognostics are often composed of cryptic, uh, sometimes poetic sections of prose that are frequently supplemented by qualitative statements um, that classify each casting as either rap, excellent, uh, zang, good, ding, uh, meh, mediocre, or uh, ngan, uh, which is bad. Um, so, for example, the following excerpt is taken from oh, that's good, IOL Tid J744. Uh, this is a, a short uh, coin divination manual, uh, probably 10th century, recovered from Cave 17 in Dunhuang. And it reads, if six coins are, I should say uh, that I hate it when people do this, what I'm doing, when they put stuff up on the board and then just read it at people, um, I won't always do this, but for the moment, I think um, uh, for the sake of consistency, it's a necessary evil. Um, if six coins are obverse, uh, the omen of water and gold is cast. If this is cast for Kim Cha, this would be the fortune of families, so in divinations concerning the client's family. Um, si Cha, the Cha of worldly affairs, so uh, politics and social maneuvering. Or Sok Cha, the Cha of human health, it is good. If this is cast for Dacha, this is the Cha of enemies, there will be no enemies. If someone has been taken as a prisoner, they will go free. If the charge is disputed, they will win. If there is a wound, it will be cleansed. If there is a sick person, she or he will recover. If someone strives for the sake of profit, it will be obtained. Uh, this casting is an omen of the Pleiades constellation in the sky, which is a shout out to astrological nomenclature. It is a sign that the Pleiades constellation is surrounded by many stars. For whatever divination is cast, this divination is excellent. Now, um, in the case of negative, because uh, this is quite a good result, uh, negative, ostensibly undesirable results, uh, textual prognostics are frequently followed by highly specific lists of rites that a client can perform in order to uh, stem any of the undesirable events outlined in the text. 
Um, so for example, I'm gonna show you uh, a passage from the Maseng del Monsawe Melon, which is an 18th century uh, pebble divination manuscript. Um, so a six stones arranged like this is a heart filled with regret. Debates and confrontations will arise with one's superiors. The people will be unsettled. A plague will spread. To avoid this, perform a great demon-bearing rite, a dadrup. Here you make an effigy of uh, the offending demon, and you can do a number of things with it once the demon is trapped. You can uh, bury it, generally hollow out some ground and cover that with a stone, for example, and, and maybe burn some fire on top of it for, for good measure. Uh, nonetheless, for whatever is cast, this is bad. Um, six stones arranged like this is misery. It is wild leopards, jackals, and dogs. Of the two, which will strike first, spears or arrows? A din of defamatory voices, it is a sign of turmoil. Perform as well as possible a demon-bearing rite and a demon-suppressing rite, a da nan, which is a, a related ritual. So this casting indicates the malevolent influence of the Gyalpo demons, the demons of bad death among women, the Jumo, who are really nasty, and the Dun demons. Uh, make a Gyaldo offering, this is a, a thread cross offering, and tie down the Modi, so you perform a ritual to trap the demon of bad death among women. It's a sign that, that the sick person will not recover and die. Nonetheless, for whatever is cast, this is said to be a moderate result. It really doesn't seem terribly moderate to me, but um, uh, there you are. Uh, taking these examples as a baseline, uh, we see that textual prognostics often open with relatively ambiguous statements, which can include metaphors, similes, or, or references to, to folkloric fragments. And a number of authors discuss this uh, ambiguous element of prognostic structure as a central feature underlying the perceived efficacy uh, and accuracy of divination practices in Tibetan-speaking milieu. Um, so, to my knowledge, uh, uh, Lama Chime Rada, who's the former head librarian at the Tibetan uh, Library of Works and Archives in Dharamsala, um, Lama Chime Rada was the first to discuss this point at length in his contribution to Lowen Blacker's 1981 Oracles and Divination. And um, Chime Rada suggests that this ambiguity is intentionally read and written into the prognostics by diviners themselves um, in order to minimize the possibility of error. So he writes that both a high degree of tact and diplomacy, as well as a willingness to express predictions with some degree of ambiguity and inexactitude are necessary elements of a successful diviner's repertoire. Now, that strikes me as a, a relatively polemical and uncritical statement. But um, whether or not we agree with him, uh, the sentiment does reflect uh, very closely what's called the four effect, which was coined by Paul Mihill in his 1956 essay very oddly titled, uh, Wanted a Good Cookbook. So the Four Effect, which is named for psychologist Bertram Four, or as it's sometimes been called the Barnum Effect, uh, named after P.T. Barnum, uh, basically pertains to the force of subjective validation. So a uh, little anecdote, in the late 1940s, uh, Bertram Four started handing out these personality tests uh, to all of his students. And after taking the test, um, each student was given a personality analysis that was allegedly unique to each individual. Um, but in reality, each student received an identical personality analysis that coincidentally was drawn directly from a pop culture manual on Western astrology. And the points in Four's personality analysis are incredibly vague, but the thing is that on average, uh, students rated the accuracy of Four's personality analysis as being very accurate, an aggregate rating of 4.26 out of five, to be precise. So, in other words, um, there may be a direct correlation between prognostic ambiguity and the perceived efficacy, the perceived accuracy of divination practices. And the four effect is just one of the ways in which that's been addressed. And it's something that's also been misappropriated um, and uh, used in ways that I don't think are entirely justified. But um, sidestepping uh, Lama Chime Rada's remarks, I think that you find a much more critical assessment of prognostic ambiguity in Barbara Gierke's recent book, Long Lives and Untimely Deaths. And um, in her fourth chapter, Gierke argues that prognostic ambiguity leaves space for the personal interpretation and spiritual intuition of the Lama, as well as serving to draw the client into the interpretive process. Um, and we're gonna see uh, in a few minutes that uh, Gierke's perspective here is echoed in a number of um, broader discourses on religion and social theory. And the push and pull between these, these two positions, the essentially positivist position that rituals simply do not work 
which lends itself to a functionalist critique, versus the more postmodern emphasis on the discursive aspects of ritual. The theoretical conflict between those two positions is central um, to what I perceive as the contemporary anthropology of divination. And again, we'll come back to this later. Um, but in order to discuss these things more constructively, I'd like to put all of this into a single tangible ethnographic context. Um, so what I'd like to do is look at a single form of divination in much greater detail and uh, take some time to try to understand its symbolism, a little bit of its mythology, and uh, in particular how it's performed today. Um, and then drawing from a few ethnographic examples, uh, we can move on to explore uh, some of the ways in which the results of a casting can be interpreted by diviners. And uh, for this purpose, I've chosen to focus on forms of divination encountered in the Tibetan bun tradition, uh, the monastic Yungdrung bun tradition. And there are, I think, uh, a few very good reasons for making that choice. Um, for those of you that don't know, to speak very generally, um, bun, as it exists today in its contemporary monastic form, is sometimes described as a um, heterodox branch of Tibetan Buddhism that, uh, according to traditional bun narratives, uh, possesses a legacy that long predates Indian Buddhism by many thousands, actually tens of thousands of years, in fact. Um, so while bun resembles Tibetan Buddhism in many respects, uh, a casual observer might note that there are a number of subtle but uh, characteristic differences that set the bun religion apart from the major Tibetan Buddhist sects. And broadly speaking, uh, these range from the organization of the bun canon and its unique cosmology to numerous aspects of material culture and ritual practice. Um, but the most pronounced difference between Bun and Buddhism is uh, probably the perceived foundation of the two traditions. The, so the Bonpos, for example, believe that their religion was founded not by the Buddha Shakyamuni, um, but by an earlier Buddha known as Tonpa Shenrab Myochi. And um, speaking of divination in the Bun tradition, if you look at the sources cataloged in the Bun Katen, the Bun uh, Canon, I think that there are two fundamental differences um, that characterize the forms of divination encountered in the Bun literary milieu. Uh, the first is that many, uh, if not all forms of divination in the, the Bun tradition uh, trace their origins back to the, the, the figure of the Buddha Tampa Shenra. And as a consequence, divination practices demonstrates a kind of canonical charter, which is lacking in some respects in the case of the major Tibetan Buddhist sects. Uh, secondly, Bun also provides us with, uh, to my knowledge, the only indigenous taxonomy of the forms of divination encountered in a pre-modern Tibetan community. And I think that the most evident example of that would be the Chashen Tegpa, the vehicle of the Shen of Prediction, which is the first of the Tegpa Rinpa Gu, the so-called nine ways or nine vehicles of Bun. And there are regional variations of this broader taxonomic system. I'm not really going to go into it. But um, this for example, is the taxonomy of divination practices that you find in the second volume of the Dojime Ziji, which is a 14th century hagiography, a sacred biography of Tampa Shenrab's life. So the Chashen Tegpa is divided into um, four uh, different types of ritual practice. Uh, this is the famous Motsi To Che. Uh, now, Mo, we have already met. Um, it is written in, brilliant, it's, it's transliterated, cool. Uh, we've already encountered Mo. Um, these would be uh, forms of divination that are largely claromantic in nature. Um, tsi would include both Natsi and Kartsi. Um, uh, these are the two branches of Tibetan astrology, one heavily influenced by Chinese astrology and the other by the Indian Kalachakra Tantra. Uh, to is a heterogeneous group of rituals that are largely apotropaic in nature. Um, so these are rituals that uh, have the power to avert negative forces, uh, like the influence of demons or undesirable social forces like slander and gossip. And um, che means diagnosis. Um, in this case, uh, it refers to forms of medical practice and uh, ethnomedicine. And <clears throat> this taxonomy of, of ritual and medical practices is considered to be one of the most uh, unique and essential aspects um, of the Bun tradition. Now, the Ziji, our 14th century hagiography um, divides each of these categories into a general section, a chihide, and a specific section, a gogi chedok. And in the case of divination, uh, the general section is described as containing um, 360 unidentified types of divination, 
whereas the specific section is divided into the uh, four <coughs> very distinct groups that you see listed on my slide. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, and I'd like to focus in particular on the forms of divination listed in the Yesitu Giju Tig. Um, uh, this is what I'm studying now, uh, this rope divination, but in particular I'm going to be talking about this pebble divination known as uh, Masang del Mo. <coughs> Excuse me. There we go. Now, uh, aside from the required texts, um, in order to perform uh, Masang del Mo, let's put up a more interesting picture. Uh, in order to perform Masang del Mo, you need to possess a few things. Um, chiefly, you need 42 pebbles or 42 beads from a crystal rosary. And those should be about one centimeter in diameter. Additionally, you'll need a, a white felt mat known as the Lashi Carpo, uh, the divine white foundation, which I'm obsessed with and I'm going to make a big deal about in a minute. Um, and that's about 15 to 18 centimeters square. Um, and these stones are cast on the mat during the, the divination. And this uh, white wool mat figures centrally in the ontological myth, the creation story of divination in the Bun tradition. And this is actually uh, something that we were doing in our reading session uh, the other day, so I, I apologize, but I'm going to uh, re-traverse a little bit of information here. Um, but this is um, a kind of Promethean myth theme, I think. There's a, a figure known as Sipa Yeman Gyalpo who looks out on young humanity and sees that it's suffering. So he gives them a number of gifts to survive, uh, one of which is the sheep, which is then used to create the primeval tools of divination. And I do think that this is a, a beautiful myth, so I'd like to share it, and in some cases, reshare it with you. <coughs> now, the passage begins uh, during the age of the Sipe Chamda Chogye. Um, uh, this is a set of 18 semi-divine siblings who are amongst the various forebears of mankind in a text called the Sipe Zopu, which is a bun cosmological treatise. And at that time, in the age of these 18 semi-divine beings, um, there's a kind of armistice between the gods and the demons, the La and the Du. And while all of this is going on, a miraculous tree begins to grow on the frontier between the respective territories of being and non-being, represented by the terms Ye and Nan. Now, the appearance of this tree is represented as an omen, but one that no one is able to understand, at least until a Cha prince named Chabuyankar, or Chau, Yankar arrives on the scene and takes it upon himself very ambitiously to interpret the tree's appearance. And what he does is he rides up to the peak of uh, Yoli Delkar, the white pebble mountain of existence, uh, riding a sheep and bearing a white feathered la arrow, a, a, an arrow of the celestial gods in his hand. And here he performs divination using a set of rope divination cords, of jutig cords that are fashioned from the wool of the mythological first sheep. And this is uh, characterized as an inaugural event that establishes divination in the world as a, a viable and accurate means of prognostication. And that is summarized quite well at one point in the manuscript where you find the following passage. So Chabu Yankar, who was greater than all, did this. He performed divination for both enemies and friends. He correctly examined the trigrams and accurately predicted both the past and the future. His techniques were better than representing truth and falsehood in the palm of one's hand, so they're much better than palmistry. Um, and they were greater than all other forms of divination and were superior to the techniques of all female diviners, which I always joke uh, that this reflects a heavy misogynistic bias. But uh, all of the treaties on calculation in the kingdoms of the world are derived from this event. Now, the jutig cords that uh, this god Chabu Yankar uses for this first divinatory act are crafted from the wool of the first sheep, who is known as Luk Lawa Walchen. And the manuscript goes on to ask um, how it is that the first jutig cords were manufactured, how they came into existence. And the text then relates the origin myth of the first sheep and its utterly fabulous wool, uh, which provides a kind of mythic precedent for a number of the objects that are commonly used in Bund divinatory rites. Now, this story begins in the distant past, which is to say before the time of the Sipe Chamda Chogye, these 18 deities. And here we meet a figure named Sipe Yeman Gyalpo, um, who's a kind of a primordial wish master and also appears as one of the progenitors of mankind. And the passage begins with Sipe Yeman Gyalpo uh, looking out across the, the entirety of humanity, which is suffering under the weight of its own ignorance. And I think that the general idea is that the god is overwhelmed with uh, compassion for humanity and thus wishes for an object that would fulfill all of humanity's needs and desires. 
And the first thing he tries to do is to distribute gold, uh, turquoise, and the five kinds of precious stones amongst the peoples of the world. Um, but this project is a failure because the people don't know what to do with the objects. Uh, the humans have no form of currency. So first they try to eat them and then people start to choke to death, which is a disaster. Um, and then the text says they just sort of kick them around uh, like normal rocks of the soil, which obviously does nobody any good. So seeing this, the god panics. And he retreats to talk to his consort uh, named Chucham Gyanmo. And he asks her, um, how can the needs of humanity be met? And she then, very sagaciously, uh, tells him to go to the peak of Yori Delkar and to bind together the essence, the Ningpo Chungli Chudu, which is a very poetic way of saying um, uh, the, 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 the essence of the heavens, the sky, and the earth, which is exactly what he does. Uh, he binds together the essences of these 13 materials, which you see listed under column one. More precisely, what he does is he takes the first 12 <coughs> and he kind of whips them up and um, uh, combines them inside of a, a fluffy white cloud. He then manifests as a white-faced horse, and in that form he makes a wish, um, asking that these materials condense into a creature that will sat satisfy all of humanity's needs and desires. And what happens over the course of the next three days, as I guess the god gallops continuously around the peak of the mountain, is that these 13 substances congeal, uh, and they become the various physical aspects of Luklawa Walchen, who then on the morning of the fourth day emerges, uh, and the god hears a sound that had never been heard before, uh, the text says, and this is the tong tong of the sheep's bell and the ba ba of its melodious voice. It actually writes that out onomatopoetically. But um, oddly enough, uh, shortly after the sheep appears, its wool blows away. The sheep has like this critical balding problem and the wool on its shoulders could not be tied down, the manuscript says, and they just sort of blow away. Now this kind of a chunk of wool, which is called a shawa kendruk in the text, um, this flying chunk of wool goes on a miraculous journey that is summarized in the passage you're looking at now. Um, and the wool first blows away, and when it blows away, it flies to the peak of the wish-fulfilling tree, the paksam shing, and it then falls down into a nest of a lord of the kyung. This is a lord of the Garuda. Um, it then blows away and um, sort of merrily summits, or circles the summits of the seven mountains that surround the world, and it then dives down and touches the head of someone named Matsun Tulmu, um, who is a, a minor figure in uh, cosmological treaties that I mentioned, called the Dodu. Um, in any case, after Matsun Tulmu, it falls down to Rubal, uh, this is the, the cosmic tortoise, who's obviously associated with prognostication and foresight in the Chinese milieu, and it then flies back to the peak of Yori Delkar, where Yeje Monpa, who's also known as Sipa Yeman Gyalpo, this is our primordial wish master, he weaves the wool into six jutig cords, uh, the ends of which are tied into little nooses called karduk, six castles, and all of that is placed on something called the lashikarpo, uh, the divine white base. And this is the wool map that we, uh, that we saw earlier. Now, uh, returning to our divination, um, this, um, uh, this, oh, sorry, I think I, there we are. Uh, now, returning to our divination, this um, uh, white wool mat is correlated uh, and imbued with some serious juice, not just the, uh, the supernatural uh, qualities of all of the things that the sheep's wool touched, but also uh, the clairvoyance of the divination's fabricator, the god uh, Chabu Yonkar. You can actually see here, uh, this is the uh, Lashi Karpo, the white wool mat with um, these pebbles that I was ta talking about. And these up on the left side of the slide are uh, the Jutig cords. Now, uh, stepping out of the realm of uh, mythology, uh, when a diviner begins a casting, um, there's always a series of preliminary invocations. Um, in the case of Masang Delmo, um, just to give you an idea, the invocations generally follow a, uh, a similar format, and that's kind of a sliding scale. The invocations begin with the macro, with Buddhas, the major bodhisattvas, and protector divinities, and then they get um, increasingly micro in their, their scope. You get a panorama of regional, local, uh, mythological, sometimes historical figures who are all asked to bear witness to the divination and to guarantee the, div the divination's veracity, its, <coughs> its truth value. Um, so, for example, um, this passage, it's a relatively brief one from an 18th century xylograph, will sort of illustrate how this works. 
Uh, the Buddha of the three perfected bodies, uh, these are the three Buddha bodies, the Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, and Nirmanakaya. Uh, the three jewels and the Tsatsumla, the deity of the three roots. The inner and outer secret Yidam, these are tutelary divinities. Um, come all of you to the Ka, uh, the Lama, and the root Tantra. This would be the speech of the Buddha to the Guru, the Lama, and to your, the root Tantra of your tradition. Uh, the, the glorious lords of the Gula, who I think are related to a set of deities called the Gula Chusun. This would be 13 gods in the Bun Pantheon associated with the place where Milarepa, who's a famous Buddhist saint, um, famously utterly destroyed a Bunpo named uh, Narobunchong in, in a magical duel. And the Tenma, um, there are 12 different Tenma goddesses. Uh, you three, La, Lu, and No Chin. Um, so the No Chin are more or less equivalent to the Sanskrit Yaksha, and the Lu are the Nagas. Uh, the moon and the stars, the fierce Yula and Shidak, um, both of which are classes of local uh, territorial divinities. All of you be present uh, now at the Che and the Mo. Um, you all lords are wise. There is nothing that you do not see or do not know. If there happens to be time, please distinguish the good from the bad. Show in detail the beautiful and the ugly, the true and the false. Conduct this uh, Notong sharp-sighted divination clearly. Now what they say, where are we? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Be present now at the, yeah, so, oh, I have it, I have it written up here. Um, so you're asking them to come down, be present in the casting, and then the ancillary prognosis um, afterwards. So the deities don't just come down, uh, they hang around afterwards to make sure that you don't basically talk nonsense. Um, let's see. Now, uh, once the invocations are out of the way, um, the deities, this divine host, that's been called to bear witness to the divination, um, they're described as dissolving into the pebbles uh, in a sort of uh, radiant, pure light. And my contacts have described this as a visualization. It's not at all a metaphor. And you can see this uh, visualization attested to uh, textually. Um, so for example, uh, here's a, a brief passage from a 19th century manuscript. Um, all of the gods who've been invoked like this, filling up the sky in front of you, descend from pure space. Dissolving into light, they melt into the pebbles. Now, uh, there's an important uh, distinction to be made here uh, with uh, spirit mediumship and other types of um, oracular divinations that are, I think, often erroneously called uh, shamanistic, uh, which is sort of feels very topical given what we were talking about earlier. Um, so in Masang del Mont, uh, the deities descend into the objects used by the diviner, um, not into the diviner himself. So analytically speaking, this means that the diviner does not use, uh, he doesn't speak with his own prophetic abilities or abilities that are temporarily given to him by a deity. Um, rather, it's the deity's presence in the pebbles that guarantees the accuracy of the divination, not the diviner. Um, and that makes the diviner's function a little bit more complicated than it might seem. Um, on the one hand, in my opinion, he serves primarily as a ritual specialist uh, whose job is to guarantee the presence of the various uh, clairvoyant deities. Um, and on the other hand, uh, to adapt David Zeitlin to my purposes, he's there as a kind of literary critic, um, an interpreter of a casting that's auto-generated by the deities themselves. Um, and that's actually a very important analytical point um, that I'm going to return to uh, in a few minutes. Um, but uh, now that the, the pebbles are in effect, uh, so I should show you a picture. This is what uh, it would look like after a casting, for example. So uh, now that the pebbles are in effect uh, saturated with the essence of this uh, divine host, uh, the casting begins. And using a very particular form of division and subtraction, uh, over the course of the casting, the diviner creates nine piles of stones organized into a, a three by three square and spread out on the surface of uh, the la shikarpo, this uh, white wool mat that possesses uh, clairvoyance itself. And I'm going to show you a brief uh, video of the casting process using the, uh, the magic of motion graphics. All right, so you begin with, I hope this works, uh, 42 pebbles, smashing, okay. They're divided into three piles, and then four by four, the diviner will remove piles until a number of uh, one to four, until one to four remains in each pile. He'll then do a m intermediary row, same process of division and subtraction, four at a time. He'll do it a third time to generate the bottom column. 
and then the remaining pebbles are uh, set aside. Now, Muslim demo texts contain a, a series of passages that describe distinguishing characteristics to each of these uh, three, 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 to each of these um, nine piles of stones. Actually, it's not the stones, it's the nine sections of the Lashi Karpo, of the, the white wool mat. Um, now, uh, as these are essential to understanding how the prognostics are presented, I'm just going to kind of dwell here um, for a moment. This is, I discussed a little bit of this the other day. But um, most importantly, um, each vertical column of stones is given a title. Um, so beginning with the left side, uh, the first vertical column is referred to as the Lhasa, uh, the God's Place. The second column is the Kimsa, and the third column is referred to as the Chisa, so the God's Place, the Family Place, and the Outside Place, respectively. Now, uh, beyond a division into three vertical columns, uh, each of the grid's horizontal rows is also ascribed a title. Simply put, beginning with the top row, these are referred to as uh, Dangpo, Barma, and Tama, so first, middle, and uh, last, or, or lower. So in this fashion, the upper left section of the grid would have the title, uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, in this fashion, the upper left section of the grid would have the title, uh, the uh, Lhasa Dangpo, the first God's place, and the bottom right section uh, would be uh, the Chisa Tama, the last outside place, and so forth. Now, uh, in addition to these titles, um, each of the nine uh, sections of the Lashi Karpo is also described as possessing or embodying a fixed set of symbols and deities. And generally, these consist of a patron deity and five specific attributes. Um, so this is an example from ooh, uh, a 19th century pebble divination xylograph that was preserved by uh, the Yangal clan in Dolpo, a very pre preeminent uh, clan in northwestern Nepal. And it outlines the characteristics of the middle god's place. Um, and these exegeses tend to follow a, um, a relatively similar structure. You have the uh, principal deity followed by all of his or her uh, physical attributes, their consorts, uh, sort of their boys. They always show up with their boys, you know, because um, most of them are demon killers, so they have to have armies at their disposal. Um, but I, I chose uh, this example because we have uh, the conflation of uh, two deities um, for all the Tibetanists in the room. Uh, the first is Yapan Kechik, who's a figure that appears in Sakyapa lineages, um, as well as Bonpo ones, um, and also Pachen Warmaninya, um, who's a martial deity and one of the heads of a brutal class of deities called the Werma. And this is a, a picture of him from yet another a 19th century Tonka at the Rubin Museum of Art. And I sort of make a point uh, 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 of pointing out these deities because the only other person who studied this claimed that the, uh, the titles of these various nine sections, um, that these deities were just abracadabra terms that had no, uh, no, no phonetic or semantic value. And that was uh, very much incorrect. Um, in any case, you have the principal deity and then a series of short passages um, at the end of each section um, that provide an additional uh, five characteristics a direction, uh, in this case uh, east, the number three, uh, the color blue, a trigram, and the wood element. And um, variations of these, um, uh, these, these signifiers appear in each of the nine sections of the Lashi Karpo. And um, in this slide, don't be intimidated by this, but in this slide, uh, what I've done is summarized all of these signifiers as they're represented in a text known as the Masang Tugi Delmo, uh, yeah, just Masang Tugi Delmo, which is a canonical collection of divination texts. And uh, looking at this slide, I think that um, several things immediately uh, stand out. So beginning with the um, uh, vertical and horizontal sections. So the first vertical column, the Lhasa, is taken to represent the totality of male attributes. Uh, the second column, the Kimsa, represents women, servants, livestock, and the hearth. Once again, a beautiful misogynistic bias there. Um, and the third column, uh, the Chisa, represents the sphere of misfortune and demonic influence. So this is all the terrible stuff that can happen to you, more or less. And relative to the vertical columns, the horizontal rows provide a, a kind of temporal schema. So the lower section pertains to children, the middle section, to adults, and the upper section 
to um, uh, the elderly as well as to patrilineal and matrilineal ancestry. Now, in addition to that, each of uh, the nine sections is assigned an element, a direction, a number, a trigram, and a color. And taken together, these represent uh, the mewa and the parka, the nine uh, magic numbers and eight trigrams that form the, the essence of Sino-Tibetan astrological systems. Now, what this says to me, in brief, is that uh, Masang Delmo manuscripts provide us with a uh, kind of taxonomy of human experience inherent to the milieu in which they're produced. And that taxonomy addresses both men and women, young and old, as well as a diversity of subjects, ranging from uh, wealth, travel, and livestock to romance, legal disputes, and, and demonic activities. And all of these are then correlated with astrological elements and numerological devices, um, all of which can be taken into consideration following the, uh, the completion of a casting. Um, now, having completed a casting, a diviner will immediately consult a divination manual. And the majority of Masang Denmo texts are composed of what I call uh, minor prognostics. And these pertain to um, uh, the, the number of stones, one to four, that appears in a single specific section of the Lashikarpo, so in uh, one of those nine uh, sections of the grid. Um, so these, for example, are excerpts from <coughs> an 18th century manuscript. And uh, generally speaking, these sections of text are composed of like basic conditional statements with a protasis and if X bit um, and the apodosis, the then Y clause at the end. Um, it, it occurs to me that I don't have any particularly negative results uh, on my slide, but we're gonna see some in just a second. And you'll note that um, in the case of negative results, the divination manuals typically offer lists of highly specific rites that a client can perform in order to um, resist any of the undesirable events outlined within a text. Um, so in addition to these types of uh, minor prognostics, at the end of Masang Demo manuals, you always have a, a massive section composed of what I call uh, major prognostics. And in practice, these work a bit like a series of trumps. Um, uh, they provide secondary and tertiary levels of interpretation that can um, supplement or a null minor results. I'm just realizing that the word Trump has forever been ruined now by my current president. But yes, these are very much like a system of Trumps. Um, and these, uh, these major prognostics have um, two forms. So there are um, particular arrangements of stones that run the length of the uh, horizontal, virginal, vertical, and diagonal axes. Kind of like you would see in a winning uh, set in tic-tac-toe. Um, for example. Or you have complete castings, uh, like these ones here, in which each pile of stones conforms to a specific number. And I'm gonna, uh, just going to put up a few examples while I talk. Um, but uh, one of the points uh, that I'd like to make here is that uh, structurally and grammatically, uh, these excerpts are very similar to the other examples that we've seen, um, spanning a period from the 10th through to the, the 20th century. Uh, now, looking at these, these examples from our, our Masang Delmo text, uh, don't forget that all of these manuscripts, all of these texts are still used today. Uh, and keeping that in mind, I think it's interesting um, that despite their frequent redaction, uh, many aspects relevant to modern life are absent from the text that we've been considering. And this is most striking, um, I think, if you consider the content of these divination manuals in relation to <coughs> the themes of diaspora and exile following the events of 1959. So there's no mention, for example, of forced relocations or the general powerlessness of individuals confronted uh, with state or governmental institutions, um, nor for that matter is there any allusion to workers' experiences under capitalism or the possibility of uh, technological, social, or medical innovation. Now this is due to the fact that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, no apparent effort has been made to revise or modernize uh, the content of divination texts despite their continued circulation in Tibetan-speaking communities. And the general absence of contemporary subject matter raises, I think, uh, an interesting question. Um, how specifically do diviners work to uh, re-signify pre-modern textual prognostics to suit the social and ethical complexities of life in modern Tibetan societies? Now, noting a similar phenomenon in 
uh, northeastern Botswanan tablet divination. Um, Wim van Binsbergen uh, has argued that some claromantic techniques are able to survive periods of rapid social and technological transformation precisely because their interpretive catalogs make no attempt to incorporate modern themes. So rather than confronting modernity directly, uh, these forms of divination resolve questions regarding contemporary subject matter by placing the client's questions within a traditional cosmological schema uh, that serves to reaffirm rather than challenge uh, pre-modern epistemological values. So the question that I would like to pose now um, is could a similar process be at work in the performance of Masang Del Mo? <clears throat> and what I'd like to do is to provide uh, a brief ethnographic example that um, demonstrates how these types of major and minor prognostics can in practice be combined or selectively ignored. Um, and I want to stress that um, this shouldn't be taken to infer any global generalizations regarding the performance of divination. Really, um, I just want to give you uh, a working understanding of the mechanics involved in the interpretation of Masang Delmo uh, prognostics. Um, so uh, in August of 2009, I was uh, living in Menri Monastery. This is a monastery in Lower Himachal Pradesh. And I was uh, researching uh, the performance of Masang Delmo by the Menri Lopan Chinni Nima, um, the head educator of Menri Monastery. And you've already met him, in fact, in uh, one or two earlier pictures. And uh, one morning, a young monk arrived with a question about his mother, uh, the monk's mother. She was planning on taking a rather long trip by car. And at the time, that was a particularly dangerous, not that the roads are ever terribly good, but it was particularly dangerous uh, because the monsoon had begun early and um, uh, the roads had been damaged by heavy rain and a series of particularly destructive landslides. So we asked basically for a simple travel divination, inquiring as to whether or not his mother would arrive safely. Uh, and, and the diviner then performed a casting, and I'm just gonna show you a quick uh, video of this that I'll try not to narrate over too much. Um, there's a huge ritual going on in the background. So it's something called Om Mang. So she the location. So it's going to blow on the stones. That marks the descent of the deities into the stones. So that's the moment when that's supposed to happen. This is one of the problems with divination, is I have friends who work on really interesting rituals that are visually spectacular. But this is a little bit boring to watch, I'm afraid. But he's um, doing the same casting process that I, I demonstrated earlier, this uh, division and subtraction on the map. This would go on for some time now. Um, so that uh, casting yielded uh, these results. <coughs> Perfect. Um, so after the casting, while reviewing the text, uh, the diviner asked two follow-up questions. Um, was the mother sick, and was she involved in uh, some kind of dispute with her friends or family? And the answer to both questions was negative. And keep in mind, uh, I'm summarizing a much larger conversation. So this is kind of like the, uh, the highlight reel of the, the divination, I suppose. Uh, but following that exchange, uh, the diviner gave his final verbal prognosis. And he said that uh, the woman would arrive safely, um, but that she might be delayed due to the condition of the roads. Um, she should also uh, protect her baggage along the way. And um, so as to avoid getting sick, uh, she should recite as many prayers as possible on her rosary. 
So, okay, what this gives us from an analytical perspective um, is the material results of the casting as well as the diviner's final verbal prognosis. So what we can do now is consult the relevant manuscript in order to assess how different types of prog prognostics are combined and how the text is uh, being interpreted by the diviner or whether or not it's being used at all. Um, and I'm not going to reproduce every textual referent that would kill all of us. Um, what we're going to look at are just sections of text that are directly relevant to the, the client's question. Um, so this is from the section that pertains uh, specifically to elderly women. Um, and the excerpt is clearly positive in its general orientation, with the obvious exception of questions pertaining to a subject's siblings. Um, now that would imply a, a favorable outcome, I think, but that's complicated by the results in the outside place. This is the section of the text where you have all the, the nasty stuff that can happen to you. Um, so in light of these passages, um, I think it begins to look as though the diviner's response is not improvised, um, but rather is rooted in a close reading of the textual prognostics, the abstract nature of which allows for a degree of elaboration in order to cater to the specifics of the client's initial question. Um, so these two results from the outside place, um, for example, state that travel will be delayed and the client's female relatives will come into conflict with an individual of equal social standing. Now that could potentially explain both the diviner's statement regarding the possibility of delays, as well as his question regarding the possibility of conflicts in the mother's local community. Um, but the idea of the mother's health uh, is somewhat more difficult to account for um, until we examine the major results associated with the casting. Now, uh, looking at these examples, the issue of physical well-being emerges as a significant theme in the divination. So the first and third excerpts, for example, um, each contain passages indicating a negative result in the case of an illness. And while some structural features have been ignored, um, like the second excerpt stating that the subject will be deceived by a loved one, um, it seems to me that the theme of illness may have been adapted from a close reading of the, the major, major results. And that's particularly convincing, I think, in that the diviner recommends the recitation of prayers uh, to avoid becoming ill during the voyage. So, um, taking this as a baseline, uh, it could be argued that in this particular case, the diviner has selected uh, several prognostic themes from a large pool of modular narrative elements which are also supplemented by a certain amount of just everyday common sense. You know, take care to protect your belongings so you don't lose any of your luggage on the road. This is very good advice. Now, I've kind of spoken as long as I, I said I would, um, so uh, by way of uh, long-winded conclusion, I'd like to return to one of the themes that I discussed at the beginning of my presentation. What really is the value of studying prognostic structure? Now, um, as we've seen, one of the, uh, the literary uh, features of Tibetan claromancy is that despite the frequent redaction of divination manuscripts in both pre-modern and contemporary communities, um, in most cases, no apparent effort is made to revise or modernize the content of textual prognostics. And um, in addition to uh, Wim van Binsbergen's remarks, I think that there are two ways to look at this as a researcher. Um, on the one hand, this provides researchers with a very reliable chain of witnesses that in the hands of a textual critic can be put into the service of constructing a comprehensive apparatus criticae. Um, on the other hand, uh, the content of, div of Tibetan divinatory prognostics um, also provides us with a unique tool for the construction of Tibetan social histories. Uh, one of the things that's unique about divinatory literature is that um, rather than being composed entirely for usage by ritual specialists, the prognostic sections of divination manuals are also written to respond to the questions posed by the diviner's clientele. So as a consequence, divination manuals provide us with uh, a kind of window onto the quotidian hopes, uh, fears, and, and anxieties common to the social milieu in which the manuscripts are composed. Uh, now leaving aside uh, historical and sectarian considerations, uh, divination manuscripts are also of immense importance for ethnographic research. And what they allow us to do, I've been trying to argue, is to look behind the curtain, as it were, to uh, study the interpretive techniques deployed in textually oriented forms of divination. 
And that vantage point affords us, uh, among other things, um, two particular avenues of attack. Um, the first would be the question of agency. So how far do diviners actually diverge from their tasks in offering responses to their, uh, to their clients? And how much agency do they demonstrate in the act of interpretation? Now, the second would be the perceived efficacy of divination practices in Tibetan communities. And this issue of um, efficacy is one of the oldest and most uh, persistent leitmotifs in the anthropological study of divination. But um, in that theoretical discussion, um, what divination manuscripts afford us is, uh, in effect, a third axis. So the first being the diviner and the construction and perception of the diviner's authority. Uh, the second being the client and the client's relationship and conversation with the diviner. And the third being uh, an authoritative or authorizing manuscript as it's perceived by both the diviner and the client. And this kind of like deathly hollows uh, Illuminati triangle thing uh, that I have here is um, uh, something, that, um, uh, something that I've adopted from Susan Reynolds White, who works on uh, divination in African communities. It's what she calls the three-way conversation. And this is a simple hermeneutic meant to stress the social discursive nature of divination and by incorporating the experiences of both the client and the diviner, um, uh, it's an attempt to account for the perceived efficacy of divination um, despite any number of demonstrable failures. Now, uh, one of my good friends, David Zeitlin, argues that we have to add a fourth point in here, uh, which is the audience, uh, in particular uh, when the audience can contribute and speak out during seances and as a consequence have a mediating effect, or if there are other diviners in the audience who are um, uh, keenly observing uh, their... Um, uh, their, 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 their sort of nemeses and communities. But um, if you're going to take one thing away from my talk, I want it to be that um, Tibetan divination practices are often um, highly composite and porous phenomena that um, bleed into the uh, social, economic, and political spheres of human experience. And uh, for a researcher, that poses a number of methodological problems, making it difficult to study the performance of divination constructively uh, without first accounting for the unique nature of the subject matter. And um, keeping that in mind, if we in Tibetan studies and uh, other sister disciplines are going to uh, move towards a more comprehensive interdisciplinary understanding of Tibetan divination practices, uh, researchers will be required to expand their disciplinary horizons and to adopt a more holistic methodology that combines both ethnographic and bibliographic data in order to chart the relationship of divination um, and of the uh, diviner to the complex social, uh, textual, and epistemological traditions um, in which divination practices play a significant role. Um, and with that said, um, uh, we can, you guys can ask any questions if you like. Thanks very much. Brilliant. But we can continue the discussion in a more informal setting at the lunch, maybe. Um, please feel free to visit uh, Dr. Smith in his office at any time. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any questions. I'd be thrilled. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming, by the way. How are you? <laughs> My mother will be thrilled. Thanks. <laughs>